On behalf of the Salt Lake Community College Concurrent Enrollment Program, I'd like to welcome you to our first episode of the SLCC Concurrent Enrollment YouTube show. My name is Brandon Kowalos. I'm the director of the Salt Lake Community College Concurrent Enrollment Program. And today in this episode, we're gonna go through sort of an introduction of what this show is about, why are we putting it together, and what can you expect as we dive in to each episode. But before we begin, let me just give you a little bit of background and sort of a synopsis of what the program here, the Concurrent Enrollment Program here at Salt Lake Community College is all about. So our program was established back in the late 1980s. That's been like, that's been like 30 years. So we've been around, I can't believe we're, we've been around that long, 30 years. And I've actually been here with the program since, uh, since I think it was about 2005, so 15 years, that's crazy. So we've been around for around 30 years since the late 1980s. Today, we've grown to about 9,000 students. We have 9,000 students participating in our program at high schools across the Salt Lake Valley. We're limited to the, uh, to the uh, Salt Lake Valley because there are distinct service regions defined here in the state of Utah for each higher ed institution. So we serve the Salt Lake Valley. Uh, we have uh, around 350 teachers or so that are around that are that are teaching at probably between 70 and 80 ish schools. I can't remember exactly, but it's somewhere around there. Uh, different high schools that we work with, and uh, let's see any other fun facts for you. Um, also, so our program. The majority of our program is sort of the traditional NACEP defined. Uh, concurrent enrollment. So most of our concurrent enrollment takes place in the high schools where college courses are taught by high school faculty who have been approved uh, under sort of the adjunct faculty requirements for the institution to teach those classes and they teach them to students in the high school. We do, however, have a small sort of sub-program called Concurrent on Campus where high school students come onto our campus and they sit in classes with adult college students. So it's mixed and, uh, and they're able to earn both high school and college credit from those classes. So that's sort of a quick high level synopsis of our program. But as we go through this, uh, through this, this series of YouTube shows, we're gonna really do a deep dive into how our program is structured and how it functions and some of the cool things that we've uh, discovered over the years. And that sort of leads me to my next, uh, next uh, thought. And that is, you know, why, why are we doing this YouTube show, uh, you know, in the first place? Like I said, I'm the director of the Concurrent Enrollment Program and many of you who are watching this show are probably in the similar boat where you manage concurrent enrollment programs and you're probably thinking, well, how do you even have time to do this? Well, I don't, but I'm doing it anyway. And the inspiration behind this show has occurred as I've attended the NACEP conferences over the years, and I've realized that there are a lot of programs out there that are sort of just getting started in this concurrent enrollment space, and they're wondering, you know, how do I even do this? I mean, my president or vice president or the state came down and said, you will do a concurrent enrollment program, and now you're thinking, and you were assigned to it, and now you're like, I, I don't even know where to begin, or I've been trying this, and, and just like, ah, I'm pulling my hair out and going crazy here. Like, wh what do I do? And as I've attended the NACEP conference and sort of shared some of the things we've been working on, the mistakes that we've learned from because we have made so many mistakes. We have screwed up time and time again. We've had all kinds of failures and yet we get up, we learn from those, we improve and we have now what we have today. Now what we have today is far from perfect. We like you are still growing and improving and making mistakes and trying to become better. But I realized in talking with folks in the national concurrent space that there was a need for some of the more established programs such as us to share some of the things that we're doing, how we're structured, what we've learned, what we, uh, what we, what we offer to students, and just sort of our program overall to give you some ideas so that you can then take those back to your program and hopefully avoid some of the mistakes and problems that we've run into over the years and can thrive more quickly as a concurrent enrollment program. So that's sort of what, what has driven this idea of creating 
a YouTube show. Hopefully, it will add value to you. And as you go through these episodes, if you discover great ideas or you think, you know, that's a great idea. We're doing something similar at our institution, but like this, and it's worked even better. Share that on the comments below the video so that you also can contribute to the broader concurrent enrollment community. All right, with that said now, we're gonna go ahead, I'm gonna walk you through sort of all of the uh, the things we're gonna be covering in the different episodes. And from there, we'll wrap it up and then prep you for the next episode where we're really gonna start diving in here and giving you some, uh, some heavy meat to chew on. All right, so let's go ahead and walk through what we're gonna be covering in all of these episodes. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna be talking about is purpose because if you don't have a clearly defined purpose, what you're trying to accomplish, and you've got that cited and targeted, then your efforts are gonna be really watered down and they're not gonna be as effective. So the first thing you need to do before you begin this venture as a concurrent enrollment program is define what is the purpose? What are we trying to accomplish? What is our objective? So I'm gonna walk through when we get to that episode, some exercises and activities that we've used to really define and clarify our purpose so that we can be much more effective and not waste our time with other endeavors that really are taking us away from our primary purpose. So we're gonna talk about purpose. The next episode after that, we'll talk about our staffing and our org structure because a lot of folks are interested in, you know, how many staff do you have? What do they do? How are you organized at your institution? Um, you know, how does that all work? We're gonna go through that in the second episode. After that, we'll talk about where our money comes from. I mean, where do we get money to staff and manage our program? Do we charge tuition? Do we, is it a, is it a full tuition, a reduced tuition? Is there state money coming in? Is there, are there other funds? How does that work? So we'll talk about that. After that, in the next episode, we will talk about how do we create new concurrent enrollment course offerings? Because, Concurrent enrollment or dual enrollment or dual credit is dual. Basically, a student is getting high school credit and they're getting college credit. So there has to be some sort of an alignment there in order for it to be truly concurrent enrollment so that when the instructor teaches the content, they're teaching high school standards and college standards, encompassing those all so that the student gets high school and college credit. Talk about how we create concurrent enrollment courses. Next, we'll talk about how we advise students and how we keep them from taking too much junk credit. When I say junk credit, I mean credits that don't count towards anything. And there is a tendency out there to say, hey, you know, concurrent enrollment is cheaper than you know regular college, so I'm gonna do as much as I can here so I can save time and save money. Um, but that creates other problems. And so I'm gonna talk about our advising program and how we, how we use that program to prevent students from taking junk credit and to take concurrent enrollment classes with a purpose and with a strategy in mind. After that, we'll talk about how our faculty liaison model works. Faculty liaisons are the individuals who are responsible for ensuring the accuracy and the integrity of the course content being delivered out in the high schools. So I'll talk about how that works. Now our program, our liaison program, is a bit unique. We did something a while, uh, a few years ago, where we, uh, where we sort of stepped outside the box and tried something different to improve what we're offering instructors and to improve the quality of the monitoring that's going on. So I'll talk about that in that episode. In the next episode, we'll talk about how we partner with high schools to manage our program because, like I said before, we have about 9,000 students. We have around 70 or 80 high schools. There is no way that our small staff could manage that size of a program with just the few staff that we have. So I'm going to talk about how we have partnered with high schools to manage the registration process, the admission process, and all other functions, advising and all that kind of stuff within the high schools. So that way our staff don't have to go out there and do that. And we don't have to come up with, you know, millions of dollars so we can put a person in every school. So I'll talk about that. 
Next, we'll talk about instructor processes. So how do new instructors apply to become concurrent enrollment instructors? How do we do the syllabus review process so we can ensure their content is accurate? How do we handle liaison visits to instructors? Basically, all of the processes surrounding instructors to ensure that the course delivered in the high school is a quality course and that instructors and liaisons have all of the resources they need to enhance what's happening in the high school classroom, in the concurrent enrollment classroom, to ensure that it is a college experience. So we'll walk through all of those processes to give you an idea of how it functions and how we have really automated some of the cool things that we do with instructors. After that, we will talk about our meeting structure. Now you're probably thinking, I'm not gonna watch that episode because I have had it like up to here when it comes to meetings, like I am done with meetings. And you know what, I felt the exact same way back in the early days of, of taking on this responsibility as a concurrent enrollment director. I wasted so much time in pointless meetings. But the one thing I've learned over the years as I've tried different things in some of our different meetings with both high school partners, teacher meetings, coordinator meetings, uh, meetings with academic administrators and high school administrators coming together, our staff meetings, through trial and error, I've figured out that there are some things that you can do to make sure that the meetings that you are in charge of add value and are actually worth your time and everybody else's time. Because there's nothing worse than attending a pointless meeting where it's just an information vomit session and you leave with no action items, no purpose, no goal, and, uh, and nobody has any sort of assignments to come back and add value to the next meeting. So we're gonna talk about how we structure our meetings both internally and externally. After that, we will talk about how do we use data to improve our program and our processes. Because a lot of times data focuses on, you, you know, how are things going within the program? Um, you know, how many students do we have participating? Um, what, what's the climate out there with students? Are they happy with concurrent enrollment? Are they not? And that's good to know, but the better thing to know is how are our processes performing and where are they falling apart so that you can go in and you can make tweaks to your program and to your processes that actually improve the overall customer experience so that then when you administer those climate surveys, everybody's like, this is wonderful because they say it's wonderful based on two things, a customer experience and then also, and also how the uh, processes are operating. If they're clunky and messy and they're not getting what they need and they're struggling, they're not gonna be happy. But if everything's flowing wonderfully, then they're gonna be great as long as their experience in interacting with the individuals in the program is also great. So we're gonna talk about data and how we use that and what we gather to improve our program and our processes. After that, we'll talk about how we handle admissions and registration. All of our students, all 9,000 students, are expected to admit and register themselves. If they don't, they don't participate. Now that sounds harsh, and it sounds like, you know, how do you even, how do you even make that happen? I can tell you it is totally possible when you partner well with your high schools and when you smooth out your processes. So we're gonna talk about how we handle admissions and registration out there in the high school. Next, we'll talk about how we nurture and maintain our partner relationships. Because as you know, you will not be successful if you do not have positive, functional, productive relationships with the individuals who you depend on to run and manage your program. So how can you be strategic about nurturing those relationships so that when problems arise, everybody's not pulling their head out, but they're coming together and talking to say, hey, you, you made this change and it's bothering us. Can we sit down and have a, have a talk about it and see if we can come up with a solution? I would much rather have people come to me and complain than say nothing, suffer, let it fester, and just watch the program fall apart. So how do you maintain relationships where you can have good, solid communications and everyone feels comfortable working through issues together? After that, we're gonna talk about 
our failure philosophy and how we handle rules and exceptions. That's going to be important because if you are working with a concurrent enrollment program, you're working with students and their parents. And sometimes from the parent's perspective, failure cannot be an option. They clear the path for their child so they don't have to run into any problems or issues. But, you know, life doesn't work that way. If your parents clear your path for you and then eventually you head off in life as an adult and then you have your first failure, you know, it's the end of the world. So how do we leverage our concurrent enrollment program to teach students that failure is okay? Failure is the way that we learn and grow as individuals. And I'm going to talk about how we've structured our rules and our exceptions policies around that philosophy and, uh, and how we handle, you know, appeals and that sort of thing. In the episode after that, we will talk about continual process improvement. We'll talk about how we continually monitor our processes to ensure that they're operating and functioning as smoothly as possible. I used to believe back when I first took the position as the director, you know, that in a few years, I would have the program running smoothly enough that, you know, I could just sit back on a beach, sip my lemonade, and, uh, you know, just enjoy life and let the program sort of run autonomously. The reality, of course, as you know, is that that never happens because as smooth as you can get your processes, things are always changing. Maybe it's a change in student culture. They don't use this technology anymore. Now students use this technology, so we need to evolve the process around that. Or maybe the state, uh, you know, uh, announces a change to legislation that impacts how we operate. Or maybe the college changes its, uh, you know, its processes and we have to work around that. So how do we continually keep tabs on our processes and operate those so that things don't get missed and they operate as smoothly as possible? And the very last thing that we will cover uh, in this first series of episodes is how we have leveraged Kenusha to strongly automate a lot of the functions of our program that are tedious, monotonous, or just you know time consuming so that we can spend our time doing other creative things that enhance our program and add value to other folks out there, such as this YouTube show. So I'm gonna give you a tour of our Kenusha system and how we've leveraged that. All right, so hopefully now that has got you at least intrigued, if not super excited, about some of the things that we're going to be sharing over the next several episodes as we dive deep into the SLCC concurrent enrollment program. Now, I want to remind you that as we go through, don't just sit back passively and watch and write down some ideas. But as we go through each of these topics, if something strikes you and you say, huh, that's really interesting, but you know, if we did it this way and this way, then we could do some really cool stuff. If ideas and insights like that come to you, don't just write them down for yourself, but share them in the comments below so that we can share with the broader concurrent enrollment community across the nation and across the world. So I'd invite you to do that. Also, as we're going through, sometimes there can be the tendency to say, oh, but you know what, I'd I'd love to do that, but, you know, I just don't have the time, I don't have the money, I don't have the staff, I don't have the resources. The last thing that I want to say before we wrap this up is that remember that anything out there is possible. Anything is possible if you are resourceful. Not that you have the resources. It doesn't matter if you have the resources. If you're resourceful, if you also think outside the box that has been built around you at your institution, step outside of it. Think different. And then last of all, if you have the courage to act. I'll see you in the next episode.